Because I got people in the back holding up that card. It says 20 minutes, Dave. If you're gonna put people in the back, they're gonna hold up a card that says 20 minutes or five minutes, at least put them in a bikini with silicone breasts. Man, it must be me. Oh, there, wait, wait. Yeah, I went through two. There it is. Here's our mission statement. I believe every facility, every strength coach should have a mission statement. It's our responsibility or job to help our athletes achieve the highest level of physical preparation using methods and means that yield the highest possible results at the lowest cost. Risk reward of everything we do. Maybe high risk, is it really worth it? I don't Olympic lift, never have. I have yet to find the studies or the information that Chris and I talked about at dinner last night of showing in 1968 at the Mexico Olympic Games of an Olympic lifter out sprinting in 10 meters, an elite sprinter. I have yet to see that. Again, you're lied to. You're lied to to reinforce filtering athletes into Olympic lifting. I started this profession in 1980. 1984, the NSCA was formed, the National Strength and Conditioning Coach Association. They shoved Olympic lifting down our throat by using that study, by saying that. I never found a study. Here's why I believe the NSCA was formed to teach Olympic lifting to our football players to filter Olympic lifters into the sport of Olympic lifting because we've done such a shitty job. Listen, last time we won a medal was in 68, a bronze medal, Irv Shemansky. We haven't medal, won a medal since. You'd think we'd do what Louis said and say, oh, guys, what we're doing ain't working because the Chinese, the Bulgarians, and don't, please don't go the drug method. Don't go the drug route. Those drugs are available everywhere. So don't go that route. That's an excuse. People who make excuses are people who are afraid to admit they don't know. So what we're doing with our Olympic lifting team mustn't be correct because we ain't winning. Now, you could talk about the Bulgarian method, which worked for certain guys. What they don't talk about is the number of athletes that were smoking cigarettes and drinking vodka in the, vo in the corner that were broken down from that type of stress. Some people can handle, some people can't. Again, you have to identify those that can and those that can't. As a staff, a considerable amount of time is spent reading and, re and researching the most productive ways to train our athletes. When everybody's done, our athletes are out of the weight room, after we eat lunch, there's a one hour time period that I give my staff and I do myself that we shut the doors, don't answer phones, and we just read or research or we talk. Now most of that talk and research occurs between myself and Anthony, you'll notice I only hire people that are born or raised in Pittsburgh or worked in Pittsburgh and understand the true still work ethic, still understand the true work ethic of, of a Pittsburgh and blue collar work. I'm not into those people from white collar uh, cities. It's you got to be a blue collar guy to work for me. Now that doesn't mean you're going to grind. It's just because you go to work at 430 in the morning doesn't mean you're accomplishing anything. I go to work at a regular time. I go home at a regular time. I got a wife. I also have two daughters. She has two sons. So my family is important to me. Now, I made the mistake younger in my career, which is why I'm divorced, of not doing that. So all you young up and coming strength coaches, you want to coach, I suggest you find that happy balance between family and your job. My youngest daughter is 25 and getting married. That hit me like a ton of bricks. I sat and cried when she called me on the phone. I'm like, God damn, where's the time gone? Because time's gonna go fast. Trust me on that. Time's gonna go very fast. So your career is important. I was building a career, but I neglected my family, which is my mistake. So what I'm trying to say is find some balance. Philosophies are for philosophers. I hate when people ask me, what's your philosophy? I don't have a philosophy. I have a system, and that system has evolved over 30 now, it's 37 going on 38 years of continually learning. That system is constantly changing and evolving. The more people I meet, and the more people I come in contact with, who I can learn from. I guarantee, like I said, Today, I'm going to talk to somebody who's going to tell me something. Here's the goal of physical training or physical preparation. Increase the biological output of the organism or system. Improve the working ability of all the body systems as a whole. No system in the human body works independent. How you do that is up to you. I don't care. As long as you pay attention to the bioenergetic demands and proper sequencing of those, those demands. Like I said, I don't Olympic lift. 
if you look at the book, The Outliers, it says you got to achieve, you have to do 10,000 hours in your related activity to achieve eliteness. I don't necessarily believe that because I believe people who are highly intelligent can achieve that faster. But think about an Olympic lifter. That's his sport. That's what he does. 365 days a year, 52 weeks out of the year. He's not interrupted by the season. He's not interrupted by breaks in training because it's so technically advanced. Think about this. The process of obtaining sports mastery, master of your sport, is a difficult enough process for the human body. Why would I introduce something that's going to even be more technically demanding? My guys, in the years that I have, and especially in college, if the 10,000 hour rule is try, applies to 10,000 reps, we'll never achieve 10,000 reps. Why would I train to be something they're going to be less than average at? It's hard enough to teach them to bench and squat, is it not? Now you're going to ask them to teach, teach something more technically demanding? Ask any football player after being on the field all day doing this with their wrists and elbows if they really want to catch a bar. I can do eccentric loading by box jumps. Now here's a rant on box jumps. I hate to go on YouTube or, let me back up, Gadango sent me a video one day on Instagram. I don't do social media. I've never seen so many fucking people live vicariously through social media of a bunch of nobodies in my entire life. I'm sure everybody in this room doesn't give a shit how I bench press for today. I'm sure everybody in this room doesn't give a shit that I squatted or how I squatted. If you do, you got fucking serious problems. And you can fix crazy with medication. You can't fix fucked up. You're fucked up. If that's what you do all day is look at guys like me and what we, and I never post on Facebook or anything. I send my wife a message every once in a while. Gadango sends me this thing on Instagram. At first I laughed. I chuckled. I didn't really laugh. Second time I watched it, I giggled. Third time I watched it, I went into a fucking rage. Text him, I said, don't ever send this to me again in your entire fucking life. Or I'm going to choke you. Anybody ever see this? Short little Ewok looking guy. Got his headphones on, head backwards, got the beard. He's going through the foot ladder like this. I'm like, holy fuck, is he fast? And everybody know who MC Hammer is? Remember Hammer Time? He gets through the ladder and then he stops like Hammer Time. And then he goes again through cones. The problem in this country, especially if you're a fucking idiot parent, you look at this and say, ooh, look how fast he is. If you look at his feet, you think, ooh, he's running a 4 flat 40. I guarantee that little fucker don't run faster than a 4 8. It doesn't transfer. That's the shit that drives me crazy is the stuff I see on the internet like that. Same thing with strength coaching in the NFL or in college. If you got that much time to post on Instagram, the internet, or all that stuff, you got some serious issues. Same thing, <clears throat> I see these theme days in college strength training programs now. What the fuck is a theme day? Halloween day, St. Valentine's Day fucking massacre, Harley Davidson day. Now I see strength coaches are breaking boards over each other's backs to get people motivated. What fucking next? Somebody's gonna light themselves on fire and run up and down the field to motivate your athletes? If you gotta motivate your athletes like that, you're not doing your job. I mean, that, that's fucking, I, I, like I said, the path that went to the right has become nothing more than a bunch of cheerleaders. Don't believe me? YouTube the guy from Alabama. I'll tell you right now, I think his fucking program is horrible. So everybody does the same fucking thing. It's high volume, it's overuse. It just kills his athletes. Ooh, you'll tell you a story about going to a college last year when they played in Florida. The guy, the strength coach, is putting buckets throughout the weight room. What's the buckets for? So they can vomit. That's maladaptation to training, people. You're giving them something they're not ready for. That's easy. Too many times in this country, too many people judge a workout on this. Oh, I'm sore. Must have been a great workout. No, that's not a great workout. You did too much. You did something you were not prepared for. Because as you look at things, things should bleed or translate into the next, next part of your program or next block. When I say block, I'm just using a period of time. All right, I'm done with that rant. So the second part of our, of our goal, our present preparation of our goals is to increase the force of power output or the competitive exercise activity or movement. Again, how you choose this is dependent upon you, the coach. There is no one top secret double probation mystical magical exercise program out there. Here's the secret. There is no secret. Here's the best. The Soviets are not withholding classified exercise that produce superhuman results. So stop using that as an excuse. Oh, they had this exercise. No, they didn't. 
They had the basic stuff. They were just smart about their training. Always constantly improve the work capacity and best performance of the specific task. That's our goal as a physical preparation staff. That should be your goal. The problem is, and back to your personal terrorists, is the first time one of my guys walks into your facility, no offense because I know you've got to generate revenue. I understand all that. If you're like JL and trains people properly, where's JL at? Right there, the big-headed guy, the massive motherfucker sitting over there. If you understand true training, your athletes will be trained properly. But here's the first thing that happened. My guys appear on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. You're an advertisement. You're just making money. I have vested interest in my people. I know when Trevor trains somebody, it's done properly. Why? Because number one, he'll call and ask me. That doesn't say I'm the guru. Number two, he understands training. Number three, he's been through good training and bad training. Here's the good thing about bad training. At least you'll know what doesn't work. Like Charlie Francis said, people and coaches are incredibly innovative in screwing up training. It's not that hard. Don't be one of those try and be trying. Don't be trying to be one of those innovators. All right, here we go with this shit again. There we go. I got 52 slides, and you notice I'm not getting through any of these. I will not get to 52. But I think, Alicia, where are you at? I think everybody got a copy of everybody's presentation. They will. They will. You'll have all 52 slides on there. And it goes over our whole template, because I got people in the back holding up that card. It says 20 minutes. Dave, if you're going to put people in the back, they're going to hold up a card that says 20 minutes or 5 minutes. At least put them in a bikini with silicone breasts. <laughs> I don't want to see a powerlifting chick. You know, I want high heels, this. JL, 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 be saying, with, a, with no shirt and a bikini on, huh? <laughs> Last night at dinner, Dave made the point that I can't talk about anything else but training. Ask him. Because no matter what, we talked about laying naked in the backyard. Now hold on. <laughs> Fucking hold on. Just fuck, time out. Because I made the comment, I live in Arizona. It's hot. I hate this shit. So when I come home from work, there's a trail of my clothes from my gym bag, my socks, my shoes, to my pool. I'm in my pool naked. Why? Number one is I got a wall nobody can see. I'm on a corner lot. My pool was literally from here to the end of this screen away. I can just fall into it. And number three, and the second most reason, because you'll increase your test levels by laying in the sun and increase blood plasma. One of the things you'll see on the slides is hyperthermic training. One of the advantages we have in Arizona because it's dry heat, and if you've ever read a guy by the name of Dar Darren Burris, everybody know who Darren Burgess is? He's a uh, physical preparation coach for Port Adeline, Australian soccer, very smart man. They pay, they gotta be smart because they pay him a million dollars a year to train these athletes. He takes his athletes to Dubai to train for two weeks. One of the advantages of training in dry heat is you increase blood plasma levels. So like training in altitude, Please tell me nobody in here gives their athletes those altitude masks. The Darth Vader looking shit. Please, just read Tony Gentacore's rant on that. I don't even have to rant on that. That's just fucking pure stupidity. When you put those masks on people. You want to cause dysfunctional breathing patterns. Listen, it's not the availability of oxygen at high altitude. It's the oxygen pressure. So up top, you have less pressure than you have down below, obviously. The closer you get to the ground, more pressure. That's why we, that and gravity is why we stay on, on our feet on the ground. <clears throat> One of the advantages is hyperthermic training. It increases blood plasma level. So it doesn't increase red blood cells. It increases the liquid part of the blood. So that means more blood, oxygen-rich blood, is ejected from the left ventricle with every contraction. So it promotes recovery for our guys quicker. So everything we do in the off-season, we train in the heat. At least twice or, or once or twice a week during camp, when we are indoors at our facility, we go outside in the morning because the vitamin D from the sun, more importantly, the hypothermic effect from training in the heat helps us develop more blood plasma, which means if you've done tempo work and some of the aerobic work that <coughs> Gadango has talked about using weights as aerobic work, and if you ever read Verkashansky's uh, Special Strengths for Strength Coaches book, he'll talk about using weightlifting as an aerobic effect to the system and increase in capillarization of the tissue. The more capillarization of the tissue, what happens? Slow blood flow down. I slow blood flow down. I increase waste product removal, nutrient product transfer. Do I not? So I'm able to promote recovery, which is what training in the heat does for us. 
Anyway, training by nature is incomplete. Of all the training variables we had to manipulate as physical preparation coaches. When I talk about variables, I mean sets, reps, load, exercise selection, sequence of events, vertical horizontal loading, similar with multiple sets, frequency, number of days a week you train, two, three, four, five, or six sessions weekly. There exists no one perfect variable. So if there's no one perfect variable, there can exist no one perfect program. It's how you interpret your science and research and how you make it applicable to your coaching environment. And that's what coaching is all about. It's an art. You don't, the only thing that separates me from you is 38 years. I started in a profession there were no such thing as strength coaches. You know what I made my first year at the University of Pittsburgh in 1980? $12,000. That's it. I was one strength coach for the first 10 years. I had no assistance. There was no 95 scholarship rule back then. I had 120, 30 people I was responsible by myself. So if you're an intern and you're bitching because you've got to carry hurdles from point A to point B, I don't want to hear it. I had an intern at Pitt, and I believe Mike was there. He said, we go on the indoor field one day. He's sitting on the turf. He goes, oh, boy, I'm tired. I looked at James Smith. I said, James, get him the fuck out of here. Fire him right. Get him fucking out. I don't want to see the kid. You're fucking tired? I'm double your age. This is my fourth group. I'm not tired. Because I think this is the greatest thing in the world. We're in the greatest profession in the world. Think about it. Look how I dress. Look how you dress. You ain't even got to brush your teeth. <laughs> you don't have to put deodorant on. You don't have to shave. Excuse me, ladies. Because nobody gives a shit how you look. They don't care about what you know until they know that you care about them and you're providing the best programs for them. So if you can't individualize based on positional requirements, and think about the sport of football, the closer you get to the ball, the more strength dominant you are. That doesn't mean my big guys don't do power speed work. The volume of work is different. If you're a skill guy, the more speed dominant you are. That doesn't mean my skill guys don't lift weights. As I said before, I'm a firm believer that the more elite, the more elite status you achieve as a sprinter, you're not lifting to get faster, you're lifting to enable the body to tolerate the demands of sprinting. And your outputs are so great when you're competing on weekends, you only need to sprint maybe once every 10 days because your outputs are so great and it takes so long to recover. Remember, Ish Uren talked about residual effects. As a strength coach, you have to take account for acute effects, immediate effects, cumulative effects, delayed effects, and then residual effects. So my last block of training before we go to camp is more designed for maximal strength because I know it'll last me 30 days plus or minus five days. How long is camp for the NFL? It's four weeks or 30 days. This week I'll have a different plan because we're actually playing in the Hall of Fame game. So as you look at all these variables, there is no one perfect fair program. Here's just rants and, pro and, and ramblings that I do. All programs work, they only work for so long, nothing works forever. Like I said, what you got you to a 300 pound bench, ain't gonna get you to 350. What got you to 350, ain't gonna get you to 400. The best program in the world, in the world is the one you're not on, I love that. We're all looking for that secret magical program. You're training high school kids, you better teach number one, first movement skills. Number two, teach them to handle their own body weight as external resistance. Number three, fill the weight room with med balls before you start putting a barbell on people's backs. That's the last thing you should think about. If movement patterns aren't in place and you're gonna disload dysfunctional movement patterns, strong muscles stay strong, weak muscles stay weak. Louis taught me that years ago. You're going to create issues with your athletes. Now, when they're younger, yes, lifting weights will help you apply more force to the ground, and they will run faster. As you get older, that ain't going to happen. David Johnson is our running back. David Johnson came out of northern Iowa. David Johnson's a freak. I don't do anything for David Johnson except for protect David from David. In the offseason, David never went above 455 pounds in a squat. We only did trap bar pulls for a three-week block before we went to camp last year. I watched him pull 665 or 675 pounds. I said, done. He goes, why am I done? I can get 700. I said, I know that. You know that. I don't need to see it. The risk is not worth the reward. I'm not preparing you for a weightlifting show. You're not going onto a platform. You're fucking done. He went home, and once again on YouTube, which I ripped David a new ass about, he's shown squatting 500 pounds for six reps. Perfect form. But he never squatted more than 455. How's that happen? Submaximal. Number one, you ingrain proper motor patterns. You bring up weak links. And number three, you only stress them when they're ready to be stressed. One thing, if you've ever read Bonderchuk stuff, and you've actually read Bonderchuk stuff, 
Blonderchuk has identified for his throwers now, which throwing is a different sport than football, of so many exposures to a stimuli before they peak. And that never changes throughout a life of an athlete. So for example, Judd Logan I know very well. Judd Logan was American record holder in the hammer. Tried to make five Olympic teams until he ruptured his tricep. But if you, when you talk about modeling, I looked at Judd and his people one day, and Milo and I were sitting there, I'm like, Tommy, what's the first thing you notice about them? He goes, what? I said, long legs, long arms, short torso, greater rotation. They're built perfect for throwing the hammer. That's modeling. But Judd knows a certain number of exposures is all he needs to peak. So that can happen in six weeks. And I think the number was 43 to 45, I believe. So in, and, and, there was a, and Derek Everly told me about a, a thrower that he had, a female, that 45 exposures, she's peaked. So he could squeeze that in a six-week block or space it out, disperse it throughout the week, and do an 11-week block. But as long as she had those 45 exposures, I know exactly how many throws Carson Palmer can handle in a week. I got it down to a T. He has low days, he has medium days, he has high days. The, the throws are undulated. It's never table topped. There's no low variability. There's high variability in his throwing patterns throughout the year. Because I've, trust me, since the day one I've got there, I monitor every throw he's ever made because of the stress of the throwing to his body, especially at his age. So I sit there with a counter every day. Him and Drew Stanton, every day I go in and put him on a tablet. Every day at the end of the week, I figure out how many throws he's made. The only thing I can't do, in which some of these data tracking companies are making, is a ball that will data now start to uh, track velocity. So now I can put them in velocity zones. So now I know exactly the stressors on his arm and what he's doing. And again, that's specific to him, taking into account his age. That's specific to Drew Stanton. Genetically gifted and young athletes have covered up for the sins and mistakes of poorly designed preparation programs. As I said, I don't believe <clears throat> in periodization anymore. After 38 years, I've given up on it. What I believe is there's no such thing as phases. I believe there are finding the most effective influences on the factors that directly link to better performance and putting them together. Yes, we use eccentrics. Yes, we use eccentrics with ISOs, but they're employed as an overall means to an end. There's too many variables to consider in our sport of physical and physical preparation for the sport of football. To me, consistency in training is far more important than intensity, exercise, selection, or methods. How consistent are they? Problem is, on our level, it's not very consistent. So you have to find ways to make up for what we're not allowed to provide. Whoever did a CBA had no concern for the athlete from a physiological or physical standpoint. People say NFL, no fun league, not for long league. For me, it's no fucking logic. Because whoever designed a CBA didn't take into account the stressors or how much time you're giving to strength coaches or preparation or stress managers. But guaranteed, when things go wrong, Evan, Aaron, Uwe, who's the first person they point a finger at? You, because you're low on the totem pole. They don't take into account, well, you know what? For the last eight weeks, he's been with his personal terrorist, and this is what has been done. I go on, somebody sent me a YouTube video of our, our wide receiver, John Brown, already doing change of direction stuff. Don't do agility work, people. Don't pull out the fucking cones. That's brain idling. That's autopilot. You're not challenging the brain. It's programmed, it's predicted, and it's planned. How's that? You want to do, you want to change, improve change direction? Do eccentrics and ISO in a weight room. Cal Dietz did that study in his first triphasic book. Read it. Pro agility. Some people did a pro agility. The other people did eccentrics and ISOs in a weight room. Guess who had the better results? The people who spent the time in the weight room and not just doing the agility work. I think agility work is the biggest waste of time. My guys, my guys stay as linear as possible for as long as possible. Because when they report for quarterback school and OTAs, they're going to get enough of that shit. Why am I going to throw, throw more on? You understand, practice is training. It's a load. It's a stressor to the body. You have to account for that. One thing we all need to concern ourselves with, as I said before, is the back end of training sessions. Warm-up training sessions, recovery. What happens between and after training sessions is often more important than the training itself. You only control two hours of their day. What are they doing the other 22 hours? I only prescribe recovery methods for our athletes three times of the year. During a block of recovery work. 
which is after OTAs, before they go into their final transition going into camp, during a competitive season, and to restore autonomic function. Anybody ever heard of the word tachyphylaxis? I know Chris, you have. Gadango's heard it. Anybody that's ever heard me speak or has been around me know. Tachyphylaxis is a word in the medical community where the drug or the treatment has lost its intended effect. So go ahead, keep using all these fancy recovery methods. Because when it comes time when you need them for your athletes, they're not going to be as effective because of the continual exposure to it. The body's an adaptable organism. It's going to adapt to your recovery methods as it is to everything. The body is not stupid. In some ways it is, but in most ways it will figure things out. Like the book says, the brain always wins. And what's even more funny is, not funny, but your, your recovery is inherently built into your system. What do you think it is? Sleep. When the body recovers and repairs itself. All day long from the neck down you have a lymphatic system, right? Your cells are living organisms. Remember that word, living organisms, Julia? <clears throat> they, they, they expel waste products. Just like we expel waste products. They take a dump, they piss. The lymphatic system drains that. But from the head up, the only way the brain, because of all its electroactivity and constantly, because it's constantly working, drains its waste products is when a cerebral spinal fluid accesses the brain. When is that? During sleep. So if you're not getting enough sleep, I always tell my athletes, you truly are full of shit. Sleep, hydration, nutrition. How hard is that? Those are the basics. Those will promote recovery. Those will enhance outputs. Because if you can't recover, you can't train. It's that simple. So part of our sports science program at the Cardinals is education. We're given before we start our quarterback school, I'm given 20 minutes to actually explain to our athletes recovery methods and why people have soft tissue injuries. We're given time that on their iPads and their lockers and throughout the building are hydration tables based on your weight. In our cafeteria, we have a totally organic cafeteria, which is great, but on all of our cafeteria tables are plackets. And those plackets are information about how to recover through nutrition. The value of carbohydrates. Don't do a fucking paleo diet for athletes. Are you kidding me? <clears throat> How much time I got, Joe? One minute. One minute, fuck. <laughs> I told you I wasn't getting through this fucking thing. How many people know who Hans Selye is? Guy coined the term stress. Have you ever read his book, A Stress of Life? That's a precursor for a nap, is it not? Read one page, you're like... <laughs> Now, we know the things that are in there now are no longer true like I talked about before. My daughter is a nurse. I made her read that book to understand how the body will adapt to stress. Go about through the three stages. The body doesn't differentiate between stresses. All stress, stress accumulate over time. But now we're finding through the brain that that is changing. The brain only, it is only differentiates between local and general stress, which I should change that. But it's just, like I said, the brain is now, we're beginning to understand the brain can differentiate between that. Stress of the response is greater for training than it is for a broken bone. The stress of training affects seven systems. Cardiac, cardiopulmonary, detoxification, hormonal, metabolical, central nervous system, neuromuscular system, and one other system it affects that most people forget about the immune system. Look up neuroimmunology and be fascinated about the immune system and the nervous system and its interplay with each other. <clears throat> All systems do not adapt at the same time. I have a board in my office, it's big letters, it says, do not overtrain the slowest system to adapt. It's also a big block letters that says, train hard, recover harder. Because we place so much emphasis on recovery. Adaptation is not an equilibrium process. You're in a constant disequilibrium between you and the environment. The body is on scene and constantly, like it says, it's a phenomenon of accommodation characterizes the organism's entire reaction, reflects the specific features of the external influences. All Verkashansky stuff, Mel Sith, and super training. It is an active maintenance of a definite level of disequilibrium equilibrium between the organism and the environment. We need to understand that. We need to underst understand the interplay between the environment and between the human body. The fundamental, it's a fundamental reason for the origin and development of accommodative reconstruction within the organism. In other words, everything we impose upon the body through training is all about one thing. And adaptation is not a linear process. 
like anything in life, is lot linear. I hate when people say progressive overload. It's not progressive overload, it's fluctuating overload. Stop talking progressive overload. You're not gonna gain five, 10 pounds on every, every exercise every time you train. It's not gonna happen. So it's fluctuating. Rest at some point in time becomes an actual training methodic. Recovery restoration begins with a well-conceived program that allows for recovery. We follow Charlie Francis's high-low sequencing. We follow vertical integration. To me, it's better than block periodization. It's better than bonder chucks, um, you know, specific development exercises, competitive exercises, because of the many biomotor abilities, biodynamic, bioenergetic demands of the sport that we're coaching, which is football. So vertical integration is probably the best I've seen, but it, again, it's adapted to the sport of football. Now here's something different we did. If you understand Charlie's program, you'll understand you can have an exposure to a high CNS activity every day, as long as on the second day or the recovery day, it's brief in nature. Elite sprinters can handle two speed days back to back as long as the volume of work is very low, below 100, 300 meters, is what Charlie said. Now, I don't have elite sprinters. My people are far from elite sprinters, so we established ceilings each position of a high CNS component. So what we did was to disperse our high CNS work throughout the week, and so they get an exposure to a high CNS activity on a daily basis as we use accelerated tempo work, in other words, based on your position, linemen never go more than 50 meters, and we don't even, and that's only one time a week. The rest of the time, the, our, our linemen are developed those oxidative aerobic system capacities differently. They're not running. They take enough abuse, so we may do rope work, we may do med ball work. As long as their heart rate stays under their anaerobic threshold, which for our big guys is 150 to 160, you're still developing aerobic capacity. So they may accelerate only five yards. Our tight ends and linebackers will accelerate 10 to 15 yards and just maintain it. Our skilled guys will accelerate out 15 to 20 yards and to maintain it. How many people have ever read Ralph Mann's book on hurling and sprinting? Ralph Mann will tell you, by 10 meters you've achieved 60% of max velocity, by 20 meters you've achieved 80% of max velocity. Have you ever seen Usain Bolt's breakdown of his world record run? At 10 meters he's at 43% of max velocity. At 20 meters he's at 80% of max velocity. He filtered that out till he reached max velocity about 60 meters. He's one of the only few people in the world have ever held max velocity for up to 20 meters. But the key was his deceleration phase. He dropped down to like 99% of max velocity, whereas his teammate Asafa Powell dropped down to 85% of max velocity. Imagine there's a gap. If you look at research, the amount of force it can produce with a single leg speed hop compared to the amount of force it's created in sprinting landing on one leg, there's a big gap. There's a 30% gap. When the brain figures that out and the nervous system allows it to happen, you'll have people running faster than 27.8 miles per hour. You'll have human beings who'll be able to run 32 to 35 miles an hour. But right now, we can't figure it there's out. Like, there's too much of a gap. So you've looked at some of the research and study that Peter Whalen and those guys have done at SMU, and you look at all the other research that's been done at speed training and resistance sprint training, and if you truly read, you understand there's still a gap, and that a gap is gonna exist for a long period of time. Uh, the first means of recovery, like I said, restoration block, competitive season, and a restored autonomic function, tachyphylaxis is the medical, medical term. Stimulate, adapt, stabilize, actualize. Unfortunately, people don't understand this. You are not immediately better after what you just did. We all want to do number one and number two, stimulate, adapt, right? How many times do we allow our athletes to stabilize? This four-week block of our athletes' training is nothing but a work capacity block. All weights are flat loaded. Everybody know what flat loading is? Here's flat loading. We put them through a circuit and we're developing oxidative capacities. They were heart rate monitors. Gadango has showed me some great stuff using the Tabata method with weights, which will help develop the aerobic capacity. And I can't tell you because I'd have to shoot you. So talk to Gadango. <clears throat> he swore me to secrecy. But flat loading is this. On Monday through the circuit, you do a set of 20, a set of 10. Wednesday, three sets of 10. Friday, two sets of uh, 15. What's 15 and 15? 30. What's three times 10? 30. What's 20 plus 10? 30. The same weight that is used on the, the 20, set of 20, the weight stays stable throughout the entire week. That's flat loading. It's an easier accommodation of simulation phase. It develops stabilization. So the first week of our circuit, we horizontal load. Everybody know what horizontal loading is? You do all the exercises for 
through group one, then two, group three, group four, all the way down, horizontal. The second week, we increase the intensity, which is actually better for strength gains, through vertical loading. Everybody know what vertical loading is? You go through it once, you come back, you go through it the second time. If you have to, you come back and go through it the third time. It's a bear, but it develops great resiliency of the tissue and durability of your athletes and helps you develop the aerobic component or aerobic capacity, which Joel Jameson talks about in his book, through weightlifting. So we, we spend a lot of time in stabilization, we're just not always adapting. The after effects of training we talked about as much part of the training process, training itself, necessary and important of how the body adapts and part of the complex signaling process between the brain and the tissues that underlines the tissue remodeling and regulatory changes that lead to increased work capacity, fitness performance. Think about this. The inflammation, the hormonal changes, the disruption in metabolical and change in the metabolical system and the enzymes are all part of the recovery adaptation process. Let the body do its job. Let the body do what it's designed to do. Help it during those three periods of time that we talked about. But my guys right now, we warm up, we train, we cool down, you're out the door. Hot tub is off limits, cold tub is off limits, Normatex off limits, everything's off limits. The only thing that's not off limits is breathing. And one of the ways we help our athletes restore to go parasympathetic is we have them lay on the ground, put their feet up against the wall, hands out to the side, six deep belly breaths in a minute. What's the first thing that happens when you lay down? You relax. Body doesn't have to seek stability. If you're going to fall, you're already on the ground. So all you're doing is opening up degrees of freedom of movement and starting to kick on the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system, which we all know there's that tremendous interplay between both of those. You have to learn to control that. We constantly try to reduce or eliminate those effects of draining that leads to diminished training effect and lesser results. Let the body do its job. Use recovery methods wisely and during specific times as not to dampen their effect. Prescribe during recovery, restoration phase of training block or block restorative training. Again, the restore autonomic name or competitive season. Am I done? Yeah. Oh, I'm done. <laughs> Sorry. No, I told you I don't like to answer questions, so I put 52 slides together so I wouldn't have to deal with answering questions. I'll be here all day if you have a question. Understand this. I am not the guru. The only thing that separates me from you is experience. You cannot place a value on experience. Because with experience, you, everybody in this room has knowledge. Everybody in this room is smart. I have wisdom. Wisdom comes from 38 years. And I ain't done yet. They asked me, our owner asked me, how many more years you got left? I said, Coach Moore is 75. Coach Tom's 81, coaching the first Super Bowl. Larry Zerline is 76. I'm good for another 15 years. So you're going to hear 15 more years of ranting. I'm going to continue to upset status quo because the only way things change in this world is to upset status quo. You want to read something that upsets status quo? Read James Smith's new book on the biodynamic uh, organization. What is it, Mike? Governing Dynamics, Governing dynamics of, of Sporting, Sporting Activity or Sport Team, Sport Training. Read that book. It'll open your eyes because he's right. The guy is right. He's one of the most gifted people I've ever seen when it comes to programming. Ask Uwe. Uwe had him on a retainer when he was in San Francisco. Most intelligent person I've ever met. Buy the book, Applied Sprint Training. Buy the book, MMA Conditioning, if you really, truly want to understand the bioenergetic demands of the sport. Again, I apologize for ranting. I apologize for the F work. That's just the fucking way I talk. <laughs> I'm from Pittsburgh. We just tell it like it is, and we have no language. My wife's an English teacher. She always corrects me. Thank you very much. <laughs>